I still remember the massive pine tree that was in front of my first house. I still remember my first house. However, when I've gone back to that house, it's much smaller than I remember. I remember thinking it was this massive thing, sliding down the stairs and sleeping bags with my brothers and running around. And I remember going back after we had already sold it and realizing this house was teeny. I don't know how they built houses that small back then where literally the roof was so much lower. I felt like me, not even being a tall, pretty average sized guy, could have hit my head on the door frame. But these narratives of our life and that tree that I grew up climbing, and I remember trying to build an elevator with it and throwing a rope over the branch and pulling myself up in a cardboard box, falling through the box because I didn't know what I was doing. This tree kind of became this uh, archetype of my childhood. It was a place in which a lot of pain as I fell, as well as a lot of beauty and joy and childhood excitement and zeal. And I think ever since then, trees have become the central theme in my life. I remember with my buddies just always riding our bikes through the forest in Escondido and getting into no good, paintballing in the forest. And I always found myself running through trees, rummaging, making forts. And I think it's why I love going away to the forest even to, these day, to this day. I love going to Yosemite. I think it's why I got foliage tattooed on my arm. It's something about trees that draw me in as I'm able to see the beauty. It's, it's something that's peaceful, something that reminds me of goodness. And so when I read the Bible and started to think through the theme of a tree and Jesus hung on a cross on a tree, it started to come alive because it's a place of pain and yet it's a place of beauty. It's a place where there's been a lot of adventure, um, a lot of confusion, a lot of falling and wondering how I'm ever going to fix this scrape that I have and get healed from that, but then also where I've enjoyed so much healing and friendship and laughter. See, what I just did is I told you a story. I told you a story in my life and how that's connected to the gospel. What Uri Hassan, a professor of psychology and neuroscience at Princeton University says is that as you hear a story unfold, your brainwaves actually start to synchronize with those of the storyteller. What she's essentially saying is that when someone tells a story, you synchronize with them and so much so, especially as you pay attention, you're able to comprehend more your brain waves and your brain patterns mirror that of the storyteller. It's as though she writes or he writes, um, I'm trying to make your brain similar to mine in areas that really capture meaning, the situation, the schema and the context of the world. Stories matter. We're going to open up to Deuteronomy chapter 6. We're going to read a pretty significant chunk, 1 through 25. If you have your Bibles, I'd love for you to grab those. But this is what it says in Deuteronomy 6. These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that your children and their children after them may fear the Lord your God, as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you and so that you may enjoy long life. Hear, Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in the land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord your God of your ancestors promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on your door frames of your houses and on your gates. When the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give you a land that is large, flourishing cities you did not build, houses filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide, wells you did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves you did not plant. Then when you eat and are satisfied, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Jump down to verse 20. It says, in the future, when your son asks you, what is the meaning of the stipulations, decrees, and laws the Lord our God has commanded you? Tell him, we were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Before our eyes, the Lord sent signs and wonders, great and terrible, on Egypt and Pharaoh and his whole household. 
but he brought us out of there to bring us into and give us the land he promised and on oath to our ancestors. The Lord commanded us to obey all these decrees and to fear the Lord our God so that we might always prosper and be kept alive, as in the case today. And if we are careful to obey all the law before the Lord our God as he has commanded us, that will be our righteousness. This is the word of the Lord. See, the reality is, is we're all born into a story. It's told by one generation to the next. And how we're raised actually impacts us in the way that we move throughout the world. See, for some of us, our story is a place of tremendous pain. It's where wounds happened by careless words or an absent parent or a recurring trauma. Others of us, we actually come from families that are marked by deep love, a commitment, and joy. And you have family rhythms, you have a sense of family culture, the time that you spend together is rich and true. The reality is that our story shapes us in disproportionate ways. So today, as we continue in our series through Ecclesia, we're going to look at what it means to be a people of God that form generations through the power of storytelling. One generation declaring to the next the story of a generational God who consistently identifies as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So my hope is that the cry of our heart as we go through this would echo the prayer of Habakkuk 3, which says, Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deed, Lord. Repeat them in our day. In our time, make them known. So the reality is if you're single, you don't have children or you have children that have left the home or you're spinning in the tornado of toddlers or teenagers, I want you to ask this question today. How can I leave a spiritual legacy? How can I raise up spiritual children within the church or said another way, in your faithfulness, how do you call other generations to worship the Lord? So the Shema, Deuteronomy 6, is the central passage for the scriptures as well as Israel, and it contains these two crucial components. It's the Shema, the hero Israel part, but as well as a confession of the nature of who God is and his creed to his people. It's this hinge that contains so much promise for the people of God. However, it says if they get this wrong, it could result in spiritual disaster. So let's look at it a little bit closer. Verse four through five of Deuteronomy is the Shema. It says, hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. This is the most famous prayer in Jew, in Judaism. Um, back then, as well as today. Today, they still will recite this prayer two times, but back then, it was even more than that. This prayer is what separated them as a nation. And it gets its name from the first word in the prayer, hear, O Israel. That word is Shema, or hear or obey. Tim Mackey, of the Bible Project explains that this prayer has been one of the most influential traditions in Jewish history, functioning both as the Jewish Pledge of Allegiance and a hymn of praise. Here the word Shema means to allow what you hear to sink in, provide understanding, and generate a response. It's a call to action. Hearing and obey, it's the same word, Shema. So it's important to remember that the Israelites, they've been in a culture that is polytheistic for generations. So they've been surrounded by people who have been worshiping many different gods. And here Moses is emphasizing the loyalty and obedience and love for God. The one true God is the only way to life. So he was saying is Israel's greatest threat was a divided allegiance. And I would say our greatest threat in our life is a divided allegiance. And so the instruction given is to love the Lord your God, love him. And that Hebrew word is the word ahava, which is translated well beyond warm, fuzzy, emotional energy you have when you like someone. It's, it's much like listening. The biblical love is about action. And so for Israel, the call to love God was a call to faithful obedience. And imagine a relationship without caring for another person practically or spending time together or listening to the other or going out of your way for them. That's a dead relationship. And so love, ahava, is actionable relationship love. And so the Shema continues. And it emphasizes that God's people are to love him with all of their being, not just a a portion of their being. It says with all of their heart, soul, and strength. Now, the word heart is leb in the Hebrew, and what that means is the center of your emotion and your mind, your intellect and your mo- and your motivation. The soul is the word nefesh, which is the essence of the person. It's your entire being. It's essentially saying your whole life. And then strength, which is your decisions and your habits. It's what you can exert. 
So essentially, he's saying there's no part of your life. There's no crevice. There's nothing that should go underdeveloped or neglected in the love of God. God wants all of us. And so he goes on in verse 7 through 9. I'm just paraphrasing. He says, write them on your heart. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit, when you walk, when you lie down, when you get up. Tie them on your hands. Bind them between your eyes. Or write them on your doors, your houses, your gates. I mean, it feels like he's trying to cover all of his bases. God's heart is not that the story of God's goodness and love would be peripheral, but central and infused in everything we do all of the time. And so the theologian Eugene uh, Merlin, he wrote a commentary on this, but he says, set before us is this vivid charge to impress the words of the covenant faith into the thinking of generations to come. He says, by inscribing them with indelible sharpness and precision. And he highlights this as an image, that of an engraver and a monument who has a hammer and a chisel in hand and with painstaking care etches a text into the face of a solid slab of granite. He says that the sheer labor of such a task is daunting indeed, but once the message is there, it is there to stay. So the covenant call is to receive and replicate God's covenant relationship. And so this is done by telling story, by passing it on from generation to generation to generation, reciting the saving work of God as our sacred narrative that we live into. And this is really important because Jesus picks this up during the final week of his life. He's asked by one teacher of the law in Mark 12. He says, what is the greatest commandment of all of the laws? What's the most important? And you'd wonder if he would say sacrifice, Sabbath, prayer, generosity. But instead, Jesus responds by quoting Deuteronomy 6. He says, hear, O Israel, love the Lord your God. He follows it up with with Leviticus, and he says, also love your neighbor as yourself. But he's reaffirming the joy-filled freedom that comes from faithful covenant relationship to God, obedience towards the one true God. So he's reorienting his listeners to the story of God passed down from one generation to the next. He's really, he's calling the rabbis, the scribes, the politicians, shepherds, tax collectors, accountants, baristas, salesmen and women, stay-at-home parents, business owners, everyone. He's calling us back to center the truth of our life on this. John Tyson, the pastor in New York, he writes that what we learn that what matters most in life is for is passion for the one true God and compassion for the people he created. The rest is all commentary. So as modern readers of this ancient text, we need to hear these words again. We need to let them sink in and provide understanding and generate a response in us. The call of the Shema is for us to bring our entire humanity before God. It's to reorient all of our desires around him, to learn to think, to love, to act, to will towards God in love for the sake of others. And then he's calling us to share that covenant blessing and impress them on your children or on other generations if you don't have children, to talk about it with them. When you're in your home, when you're walking, when you lie down, when you get up, it's to live beautiful and compelling lives so that your children will want to opt into it because of God's goodness that is etched on your own heart. And so what would it look like for us to steward our stories in the context of relationship? so that we will provide a spiritual inheritance for the world around us? What would it look like for us to be men and women who impart a blessing of God's covenant? In Luke 18, um, at the very end of the parable of the persistent widow, Jesus is asked, or this is what he asks. He says, when the son of man, his favorite name for himself, when he returns, will he find faith on the earth? It's important that Jesus didn't say, will he look for perfection? Will he find moral absolute? No, he looks for faith which means that we need to have faith. And so we must resist spiritual complacency. Deuteronomy 6, 10 through 13, as he's continuing on in this passage, God gives Israel a caution. And he pretty much just says, hey, when you go into this land and you are eating all these things that you didn't work for, you're living in homes that you didn't build, you're you're participating in all this stuff. He says, when you eat and are satisfied, verse 12, be careful that you don't forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt and out of the land of slavery, the fear, fear the Lord and serve him only. Essentially what he's saying is don't be numbed into spiritual apathy. One of, if not the greatest hazards, I think for us in our call of followers of Jesus to see his kingdom come in our lives and the lives of people around us as it is in heaven is apathy. 
Apathy is the numbing or the lull that we can find ourselves in. It's when our faith is dormant, right? It's by title. It's a title that we hold, but it's not a life that we steward. The flame of our affection for Jesus is like gray ash in the fireplace and is not set ablaze with passion. So Romans 1, Paul writes, he says, For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. Ignatius of Loyola says that the root of all sin is ingratitude. Spiritual complacency and apathy is a result of an untrained heart in gratitude. Gratitude is the practice of reciting a good story with thanks, which means that the posture that we're called as a church to cultivate as a people of God is one of gratitude, humility, and awareness. Paul continues to explain that if we don't do this, we'll exchange the true story of God, the substance of all things, with a shadow, with something less than, with a half story. And so we learn this lesson in the book of Judges. The danger of generational faith is that it is always just one generation away from apathy. We see that after Joshua dies, Judges 2, it says another generation grew up who neither knew the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. They forsook the Lord and the God of their ancestors who had brought them out of Egypt. They didn't tell the story. They failed to pass the blessing of the covenant. You see, when Israelites failed to use the oars of God's story to continue to propel the boat of the next generation forward, they were taken by the cultural current downstream. And like the Israelites, surrounded by the strong tides of the cultural narrative, ones of Baal worship, Pharaoh and Caesar loyalty, pleasure consumption, and the sacrifices needed to appease that lifestyle, we also find ourselves drowning in a culture, uh, in the currents of our cultural narratives. The most effective discipleship experience in the world is not the church. It's the pervading culture. I remember, um, because we have a relatively young staff, I remember sitting at staff meeting and and they say things all the time where I'm like, what does that even mean? And I'm not even, I'm not even that old. Let's just be honest. I used to be a youth pastor. So I used to be in with it. And now I feel ancient as I'm hanging out with them because they'll say things like, oh yeah, that ate down and left no crumbs. I'm like, what does that even mean? And, uh, and so I, I would ask him, like, where did you even hear that? And it's not like they can name like one TikTok or one YouTube or one location that they heard that. Their response is, it's everywhere. Where, where did you hear that? Everywhere. It's this everywhere that shapes our lives. Christians have been wrestling with the formative power of the everywhere for millennia. We have to be aware of the small daily habits that recruit our affections and become gods that we worship. Richard Lovelace writes that inordinate affection, meaning loving ourselves or others or things more than God, always bends us out of shape. So there has to be intention, purpose, discipline in order to keep ourselves from inordinate affection and being bent out of shape. It takes intentionality. So Paul, he's writing to Timothy, who in regards, in many regards, is a spiritual son to him. He writes this in 2 Timothy 1, 5-9. He says, I'm reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother, Louis, and in your mother, Eunice, great names, by the way, and I'm persuaded now lives in you. He's saying faith was passed on through the generations, through the mothers of the faith. But then he says, for this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands for the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. In the generation, uh, or in a generation story of faith, we need to fan into flame the gift of God to contend against spiritual complacency. Question is, do our children, the children of our generation, the generation around us, do they sense the flame of God inside of you? And are you passing on sincere faith, one marked by intimacy with obedience to the person of Jesus? We must resist the cultural narratives. Ronald Rollheiser, he says it like this, Western culture today is so powerful and alluring that it often just swallows us whole. Its beauty, power, and promise generally takes away our breath and our perspective. The lure of present salvation 
money, sex, creativity, the good life, has for the most part entertained, amused, distracted, and numbed us into a state where we no longer have a perspective beyond that of our culture and its short-range soteriology, which is another way of saying it, it's a short salvation. And those who follow Jesus, our perspective should be as vast as what Romans 11 says, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. It should be expansive. And yet in our culture, it's limited to what's right in front of me right here, right now. We get lulled and numbed. And so is there anything in your own life? If we're going to pass on faith to the next generation, is there anything in your own life that has subtly and skillfully crept in and has lured you into its short-range salvation and numbed you into a state where you no longer have perspective? We need to ruthlessly eliminate that from our life. These small things within the nation of Israel led them to spiritual disaster, but it'll do the same thing to us. So we have to exercise counterformative practices that shape our culture rather than allowing culture to sculpt us. We need to fix our eyes on Jesus. That's what Hebrews 12 tells us. And that's what the church is. That's what the ecclesia is. It is a counter narrative community. It's one that models and shares a beautiful story and a beautiful God. So the church as a counter narrative community does not accept the status quo, but rather through tangible actions steps into the brokenness of the world and begins to release prophetic imagination about what life can be. But the only way to do that is to live and explain and know a compelling story. We must tell a better story for generations to come. So I just wanna land on practicals. There I think are environments of generational blessings that we can step into. The first is, well, the, the, to name the three, it's the home, it's, your own lifestyle, and it's discipleship and mentorship. So let's just start with the home. In Deuteronomy 6, what it's highlighting is that God's design, the biblical history that we see shows that faith, the flame of passionate faithfulness to Jesus and life with him was a family responsibility. It was a family endeavor. It was in the home through the parents and the family that stories of faith were told. Where God's goodness and faithfulness was shown, the life and character of Jesus was displayed. So ultimately, parents, if you're a parent, you are the primary nurturers of your children's faith. And the church is just to play a supportive role. The church doesn't abdicate its responsibility to teach your kids on Sunday and through events like VBS and other things like that. Because we're all called to gather consistently to open the Bible just as we do as adults. But what's going on here for the kids and for the adults should just be a continuation of what's going on in the home. So with that, our hope as a church is just to inspire, equip, and support you to be able to do this in your home. To be the best fanners of holy flame in your house. So what would it look like for you to begin thinking through your daily routines and your life as discipleship for your family? How does that change the way that you view your role as a parent? Not simply to make sure that they just survive their own crazy behaviors. I know that's my mom's fear for me. And hopefully, you know, they just become good people. But instead, through the habits of your home, the words that you speak, the life that you live, that you pass on faith. See, we want to see our children surpass us in love for Jesus. We want to live full lives. We want them to live full lives in Jesus' name. So what would it look like to be so dedicated to reading scriptures for yourself that your kids would walk down the stairs, they would catch you in that chair that you're always in every morning reading your Bible because that's what you do. And if your kids would just catch you reading the Bible, that would tell them something about the God that you worship. What would it look like for you to adjust your bedtime routines to incorporate time for reflection and gratitude, prayer, and blessing? What about when you head out the door, when you drive in your car, or when you practice Sabbath? One thing that I was thinking about is just a really practical outworking of this is have you shared your testimony with your children? And if you're not a parent, have you shared your testimony with someone else? Maybe someone from a younger generation or a different generation. Have you told the story of God's goodness so next Sabbath for you, if you're a parent, would you just make a good meal? Would you share some things from the week where you saw God and where you were thankful for that? And then share your story. 
pass along faith. Maybe you don't even know you have a story that's worth telling. And what I would encourage you to do is to sit down, reflect, map out the story of God's goodness and faithfulness in your life. Map that out and realize God has been so faithful and he will be and now you have a story. And then live that story out because the truth is is that faith is more caught than it is taught. Which leads me to the next point. This is for people who have children, but also for those who don't have children. Your lifestyle matters. It tells a story. Leslie Newbegin says that we must live in the kingdom of God in such a way that it provokes questions for which the gospel is the only answer. So whether we know it or not, we live our lives the way that we genuinely pursue Jesus and the way that we cling to the vine that is Jesus and allow the natural fruit of the Spirit to flow out of our lives is the greatest story. It's our greatest story. Deuteronomy 6, again, the central prayer and context for Israel was a call to hear, which meant to obey, live it. And then to follow it up, he says, don't forget, make your faith central. Like he just didn't give us room to forget where faith comes from. He puts his, put it in front of your face, put it on the door frames, put it as you walk and as you lie down. Do this in such a way that it would be hard for you to not live purposefully and beautifully. So how can you specifically lean into Deuteronomy 6 in your life and allow creativity to flourish. I know some people just throw sticky notes on their mirror. Or they write things on the mirror. It's just scripture. What would it look like for you to lean into memorizing scripture or, or, or listening to worship music in the margins or spending time in prayer, just breath prayers, small ways that you will not forget God's faithfulness. In what ways can you fan into flame the faith that you have? And are you living such a compelling story through your life that people can't make sense of it except for the gospel? That's the call. You know, the goal of my life, I've been thinking about this a lot, is um, I want to be, be more passionate at 70. We have an incredible, our 6 p.m. service, if you haven't been to it, is just full of multiple generations, but mostly young adults. And when you look at the young adults in our church, I mean, there's an incredible passion, a move of the Spirit of God is going on. And it's really cool to see. But I mean, why don't our 70-year-olds take our 20-year-olds? Like we should grow more in passion, but over the course of time and the numbing of the cultural currents and the narratives that we live into, the hard knocks of life and, and real wisdom as well, the reality is, is that we've burned our flame out and we, I want to see the 70 year olds in our church take the 20 year olds. I want to see passion, not just passed down, but passed up. I want to see the generations above thinking through, I mean, how can I worship God with everything I have? I'm not too old for this. I'm not too mature for this. God deserves my entire life. I want to see the 70 year olds passing the 20 year olds. Let's get after it, church. And that leads to the final thing, which is discipleship and mentorship. See, if you're young and you desire a mentor, I always desired mentorship. And I remember really wrestling with it because I was like, I really wanted, and this is my own ache and my own story and pain points, but I always really wanted someone to identify me. And I wanted them to be like, you, you have something special and I want to meet with you and call me out. And the reality is, is that very rarely happens. And so if you want to be invested in, Come with a list of questions. Think through specific directions and things that you want to be mentored in. Be specific and then make the ask. Find someone that you look up to. Find someone who's got grayer hair or no hair. Find someone who's done life a little bit ahead of you. Go and ask them, say, hey, I want to spend some time with you. Will you mentor me? I want to buy your coffee. Invest in them. Show them that you want to honor their time. Buy them coffee. Buy them a meal. Desire their wisdom and, and honor that. And also maybe set some boundaries and say, hey, I don't want you to be stuck in this for life because, you know, that could be really daunting. But hey, just for the next three months, can we just meet every other week or once a month? And I just want to ask you some specific questions and I want to gain your wisdom. And maybe that continues on. And if you're a little bit older, especially if your kids are older as well, maybe they're out of the house or it's a little bit more manageable, I think that we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to begin spiritually parenting and passing on faith. We must do this. You don't just do that in the home. We have spiritual children, spiritual brothers and sisters of the faith that we have a duty and an obligation. Deuteronomy 6 shows us this, to pass on faith. So I wanna encourage you to pray into this. What would it look like for you to practically and intentionally step into God's call 
to pass faith across generational lines. God is a God of generations, and we have a call as a church to follow God in this way. So let's network together as a generational church that follows a generational God that wants to not just hear, but obey. Would you pray with me? So Lord, I pray that um, our hearts would be good soil. And that as we hear the word, the seed of your word, um, would it sink into the good soil of our heart, God, and take root. Lord, I pray that you stir us, you change us, transform us. God, I pray that we're better as we grow older, that we grow more into passion. Lord, fan us into flame. God, I pray that we'd be a church that just gives everything over to you. God, that we wouldn't have nooks and crannies and areas and crevices of our life that are just untouched by you. So God, would you search us and know us? We just, we pray that prayer. Search us and know us. That prayer of Psalm 139. Search our hearts. Know if there's any offensive way in us. God, thank you for how you formed us. Thank you that you are a generational God that continues to carry faith forward. We stand on the shoulders and legacy of people before us. And so God, we thank you for them. It's been your faithfulness. And so God, would you use us? As Habakkuk said, God, we want to see your fame and your deeds in our time. Would you use us, Lord? I pray for homes in our church to be transformed by your gospel. Help us to have habits and rituals in our life that shape us and form us to be more like you. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Grace and peace, everybody.